So, Alan, I want to talk about um, my first lesson with you. And, you know, uh, I, t I tell this story to a lot of people. One of the things that was really a profound uh, experience was uh, you picked up a ball, it was like a tennis ball, and you stood in front of me and you just started bouncing the ball. And that was like the, the lesson, you know, like the first part of the lesson. And, and basically you were just, you know, showing me, you know, the physics of a ball bouncing on the floor and how the stick uh, not being, you know, rubber, but just the whole idea of how naturally, you know, the stick should bounce. And it was a very fundamental, but uh, probably the best explanation of, of what it's all about to be as natural as you can be. So that for me was really kind of blew my mind right away. And uh, you had me on for two years. We were on the pad. We were on just the pad working on technique. And you, you, uh, you were totally cool with me playing my drum set at home and everything. And um, and uh, but we just kind of worked on my technique. And um, there's so much more I want to say about it. But I just want to start it off like that. I don't know how it was for you when you first met me. Who you know? What you thought you were getting into? Well. Uh... I, I didn't ha have any idea where, where it was going to go, <laughs> to be honest with you. And uh, you were a very quiet child. I mean, you hardly spoke at all and were very introverted at the time. And uh, so I didn't know what was going through your head at all, but I figured I was going to show you this stuff. And if you, if you did it, you did it. And if you didn't, you didn't. Most kids didn't, you know. Uh, I had very few students from the beginning stages because I demand uh, that you work on technique first be before we really talk about the drums because if you don't have facility then you can't create a sound and there's no point in playing the drums if you don't have any technique to play with. So I always felt it was important to uh, understand how to make a sound and you know what constitutes speed and volume and dynamics and all of that stuff and the rest will, f will fall into place. You know, so. That's really what I tried to do with you is to get you to be able to use your hands in a manner that was, that was pleasing to yourself, that felt good, that would be able to uh, let you express yourself a little bit. And to my surprise, you came back the following week and you had done all the exercises, which I can tell immediately as soon as you walk in and sit down and, and play two strokes, I can tell whether you've done the work or not. And that continued for two years. I, I, it was very incredible to me how diligent you were at 12 when you were 12 years old? It's 11. 11? Yeah. And, Going uh, on 12, though. Yeah. And you did, uh, it was very dry. We didn't work on a drum set. It was very drum pad, metronome, very dry, exercising, rudimental, stick control. And you did it and came back and, and uh, always returned the work to me completed. So I want to talk about Joe Morello because, oh, okay. uh, you know, uh, you turned me on to Joe and he was your teacher. And uh, there's definitely some things you passed on to me that obviously uh, is coming from Joe, uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, relaxed technique that I often, I get comments on all the time. And I, I you know, I, I don't, it's not something I think about when I play anymore. It's just a natural thing. and. Uh, and I really, you know, owe it to you, of course, and Joe. And you, you, uh, you pointed me to Joe after a while, and I took a couple lessons with him, and then I revisited him again. He's a fantastic teacher and drummer. I've seen him play live, and the uh, sweetest guy, and just, you know, just wonderful. So, so you know Joe. You were a student of his. What, tell, us, tell us about Joe Morello. Uh, he's from New England, and he, he studied with... Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Sepchik was his first uh, drum teacher, the local drum teacher, and then he went to Boston and studied with, uh, with George L. Stone. And um, then uh, he went to New York. I think he played with, uh, he played with Tal Farlow for a while uh, and uh, some other people, and uh, uh, Mary McPartland, he played for a while, and, and, and then he got in with Dave Brubeck and wound up, I think it was a 12-year run with, with Dave Brubeck, and they recorded the Take Five album, and he did the drum solo of Take Five, which which was world famous and really established odd time signatures, I think, for jazz music and for and for drum soloing, and 
And he, he was amazing because he was so, so humble. I, I remember getting very confused because when I, when I first came in to see him, I was already a successful drummer. I was already on Broadway. When was this? What around what year? This is this was Superstar. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. That Jesus show. Jesus, Jesus, Super, so it was yeah. 1970. Okay. And uh, I think I'd taken one lesson before I went out on the road show. And uh, was why, did, why did you? I'm sorry. Why did you feel like you needed to take a lesson at that point since you're already? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. All right. This is what this is what I came to. All right. I was t 24 years old. And I wasn't getting any better. I wasn't getting any faster. I was practicing three, four, or five hours a day, uh, and I was getting worse. I was getting tired. And then I, I would look at Buddy Rich, who was at the time in his 60s, and he was playing three times faster than me, twice as long. I mean, I, and I looked at all these older guys playing, and I'm saying, when I'm 60 years old, am I going to be able to play anymore? I'm, I'm not going to make it. Mm. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have problems and physical problems. So you were sensitive enough to feel that, like, you're physically struggling at a certain point. Uh, yes, I was physically struggling with my, and I was very diligent about practicing all my life, you know. Uh, and I'm, I was bl I'm getting blisters and, and blood blisters and mm -hmm. all, all kinds of uh, stuff. But I was very successful. You don't need good technique to be successful. You just need to have an ear and to have something to say. And so I managed... Uh, to get into in, you know to get into Broadway shows and, and make good money. So Joe looked at me and said, "Well, what are you what are you doing here?" And he said, "Well, I want to you know I want to learn to play like you." And he said to me, "What do you want to learn to play like me for?" As if that was ridiculous. Huh. And I said, oh, "All right, all right, uh, I'll play like me, but I want your hands. <laughs> Just give me your hands, and I'll play like me." But but he was so humble he couldn't understand why anybody would want to emulate him as a drummer. Well, that's a good message, though, yeah. that because he, you know, he's instilling, you know, finding your own voice. Yet, yes, he's going to give you the technique, but you got to find your own voice in that. Well, he he could he thought I already had my voice. He said, mm -hmm. "Wow, you're doing great. What do you need me for?" Mm -hmm. Which was really true. I mean, I could have gone on and continued to make a living, mm -hmm. but I knew in my heart that I was in trouble, and uh, I needed I needed to make a change, and so I I trusted him. It was pretty frightening because I was playing rock and roll, and uh, I, I mean I couldn't play one stroke. I came, I was devastated. After 12 years of playing the drums, he uh, he started me at the first notch on a metronome, 40 on the first on the, page. On the metronome. Yeah, 40 on the metronome, which is the lowest Very mark on the metronome, as slow as you can go. First page in the book, first exercise. He showed me how to do it, and I couldn't do the first exercise. One stroke, I couldn't do it after 12 years of playing. I said, well, wow. It was a whole new, must have been a whole new way of thinking uh, and playing. Total 180 from what I was doing. and uh, That can and, be, you can hinder, <laughs> you could... Well, it did. it did. At first it did because I could, you know, he told me to practice this way, but don't be concerned about it with on the, on the drum set. Just play normally the way you normally play on the drum set. But what happened is that, you know, as I'm practicing this other way, I wasn't prepared to play that way yet, and yet I stopped practicing the other way, so my technique was degrading the way, the way it used to be. So there was a transition point there where I wasn't, I couldn't do what I used to do and I couldn't do what I wanted to do yet. But I had to live through that and, I, and it, was, it was faith in Joe that got me through that because I, I didn't even, I wasn't even sure I could play rock and roll that way. You know, I mean, that's, that's jazz technique, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous, of course, because technique is technique right, and right. music is music. But that's right. not the way I saw it. I saw it as like, ow, oh, I'm, I'm whacking two and four and, you know, he's, he's telling me to let go of the stick. Right, right, right. So, wow, how's that going to work? You know, so for about a three-month period, I was in limbo, and, and uh, my faith and love for him is what brought me through. And if I, no other teacher, I think, could have done that for me, that I had that much faith in to give up my stuff and put my career in, on the line. Uh, I want to tell you a little something about Joe, my experience. Oh, yeah, him. okay. I remember it was in Irvington, New Jersey or something. That's some right. Music store Dawn, something? Dawn and Kirshner's Music Store Dawn in Kirshner's. Irvington, New Jersey. And it was, a, it was a funky place upstairs, I remember, you know, and and, uh, and Joe was there, and, you know, Joe's uh, he basically blind, right? Legally. Yeah. And so, uh, anyway, so uh, I sat down uh, on the drum stool, and he had me read from a book, and I don't even know how he knew the page, because he could barely see it. And I'm like, how's this guy going to give me a lesson when he can barely see, you know? He's got to be led here and there. And uh, Well, yeah, he said, okay, do this exercise. And I'm like, look, look. And 
or did you just do this for me? You know, and I started playing, and the first thing he did was push my elbow and um, to, to, to see and feel how loose I was. And if I was loose, everything was cool. And that's, he really focused on, on that. He wanted me to be loose. He wanted it, and, and, and then he started to get into accents and how you can use your arm almost like a whip and stuff like that, you know, and that, that was, shed some new light on, on that stuff for me. But he was the most, you know, just sweet, gracious, generous guy and funny and had a really, you know, great personality, you know. He's really, really a wonderful guy. And uh, so that was great, and I and I and I, 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 I could see where where you, where you got all that stuff from. But well, he showed me how to teach. He was he was the example of what a mm -hmm. teacher should be. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, after talking about Joe and you speaking about what it was like to be with me, I. I Curious to know what your experience was with other teachers. What, what, what was that like with the other teachers? After you, there was a, a little struggle finding someone. Then we finally found someone in New Jersey, uh, uh, Chuck Spees. I don't know if you knew sure, Chuck Spees. Sure, yeah, Chicago. Was, yeah. The drummer with Chicago. Right, he did Chicago. Another Fonzie drummer. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And, and he, had, uh, he, had a, um, he, he had that style of that kind of ragtime style in a Broadway sense, and so that was kind of cool. But he gave me charts, and right away he, he started getting me into playing big band stuff like uh, Woody Herman stuff like that. So there was getting into that big band world, um, and so that was cool. Uh, and, and Chuck was great, and his, his, his wife was a rockette with my mom, so that's how, that was that <laughs> oh, connection. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, after Chuck Spees, there was this, uh, another drummer named Sonny Igo, who had actually played with Woody Herman. And uh, he got me into reading uh, sort of uh, from his book, which was about reading big band charts. I think that's around the time where I came back to hook up with you and you gave me the dancing job. And that busted open my whole world, you know, it's a whole other good thing. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, it was good timing, yeah. Uh, and, and so, and then after dance, and I had, uh, it was just as far as getting work, you know, I was working in a rock band in high school, I was playing in a jazz band, I was playing in a concert band, I was doing some, I was, you know, writing cadences for the marching band, which was kind of fun. I was leading mm -hmm. the percussion section there. I was getting into condu conducting a little bit, dabbling a little bit, Manhattan School of Music, uh, prep, division uh, in the orchestra um, and percussion ensemble stuff and uh, Juilliard a little bit and then after high school just doing extension division stuff. Then there was uh, you know a lot of a different period working with a lot of different people but I started to get into kind of like cabaret kind of things and off off Broadway stuff and uh, uh, really lost felt lost in that world. I mean some of it was was cool but uh, I definitely I was in limbo. I was like, uh, something was not right. You know, that the Broadway thing was like, this is not for me. I realized it's not for me and that, what my dad calls legitimate music, you know. <laughs> uh, union job, orchestra, right, yeah, in the pit, yeah. you know. And I'm Health like, care, Dad, pension. I'm trying to do this thing that you did, you know, and it's just not working out. Uh, but I loved playing in orchestras. I loved orchestral music and, and I would do pickup gigs, you know, with like the Merrick Symphony out in Long Island in the summer, and they would hire me to be the drummer and percussionist, so I would do both. And that was okay, but you know, it just more and more I got in that world, I realized this is not for me. I just don't feel comfortable, you know. I just don't feel comfortable being this, this, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I was really expressing myself enough, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was just uptight. That's basically what it was. It was just like an uptight world. And like after playing rock and roll and getting into some jazz stuff, I realized that I can't go in this direction where uh, it's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just hired to play these specific parts and that's it. There's nothing else. You don't interpret in any other way. It's this is the way it is. That period was, uh, you know, dabbling around with other, with other, other gigs, you know, a lot off Broadway, like I said. And uh, then uh, I had, I did a session with my old bandmates from high school and I had this uh, this experience where they they put a, a lead sheet a chart in front of me and it said samba on it you know so when you see uh, sometimes you know you'll see a chart and it'll kind of give you the what what the feel is gonna be swing samba tango mambo 
cha-cha-cha, all the Latin terms, you know, and I always kind of just bagged them into one term. I didn't think there was much of a difference. <laughs> and that's how some drummers did play, like some kind of club, uh, club date drummers, which sort of like, you couldn't tell that the difference between a samba and a mambo sometimes, at least that was my experience. So to make a long story short, I had a humiliating experience because I couldn't play a samba. You know, we're playing this thing, and the guy would stop, and he—he he was my friend, and everything. But he'd be like, "No, it's you got the bass drum, ba doom, da doom, da doom, da doom, and you got a certain rhythm." And I was—I was lost, and I was kind of embarrassed that I didn't know, and I didn't even know that samba was from Brazil, and I didn't know really where Brazil was. <laughs> I mean, I was really in the dark, you know. So after that, I was just like, really, it was really embarrassing. And so after that, I was in search of finding out what the hell a samba was. And I uh, was looking through the Village Voice paper, and in the back I saw in, in the want ads and all that, and you know, wanted musicians and all those want ads, I saw samba classes at the Drummer's Collective. So I was like, samba classes? Drummer's Collective? This must be you know, where I'm gonna find out what samba is. Yes. So I went on 42nd Street, uh, is where Drummer's Collective was at the time, right around Times Square. I went there, just got on the bus uh, into the city, uh, went up the elevator, and as I'm coming up the elevator, I hear, you know, this really like different kind of like funky rhythm going on. Like, and uh, I got the elevator opened and I walked, I remember this like everything, the smell, the feel, the look of everything. Got out of the elevator and walked towards this group of people that were playing in a circle, and all the people were like, from different walks of life, and it was like, I, I, my heart was in my throat, I was choking up. I mean, it was such a profound thing. I was like, it wasn't that, oh, now I know what a samba was. It was just like, what is this most amazing drumming? You know, like, just this, like, melodic, you know, you know, um, deep, sophisticated, rhythmic thing going on here. So I fell in love with this stuff. I just, you know, I, I went to every class, uh, for you know years, and uh, I got so into it that I dropped the drums for about a year. I didn't play the drums. I just wanted to play percussion. I just wanted to play Brazilian percussion. That's all I wanted to do. I just fell in love with it, and I became close with my teacher at the time. His name was Manuel Monteiro. He's back in Brazil now, but he was a young guy who you know was very dynamic and really was uh, you know into teaching this class and sort of trying to create a band from it. Um, and I became his, one of his best students and I ended up teaching the class <laughs> you know, after a while. Uh, then he started, then we started applying those parts to the drum set. Because with Brazilian music you have like, you have, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, you know, they call it partido alto and sordo drum is the low part. And there's these different parts and it's like, it's like, um, it's counterpoint, you know, rhythmic counterpoint. And that was probably one of the most, the biggest turning points, you know, for me at that, at that so time. you took your weakest point and made it your strength. Ex yeah, pretty that's much. True, right. That's true. Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah, from yeah. this humiliating experience where I was completely naive and didn't know anything about it. Uh, instead of running away from it, I wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, see what it, what it was. And, and it was exactly what I needed. And it changed my life forever. And that's where you know, uh, I started to meet other people who were into a certain kind of thing, uh, and not just one kind of thing, many kinds of things. People who were into uh, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Cuban, Brazilian music, jazz, and all these jazz musicians used to come. That's where I met Jaco Pastorius, you know, from Weatherport, and um, incredible bass player, composer, uh, Bob Moses, who became you know, a mentor of mine and, a, and uh, took me under his wing and his band. Uh, Mike Gibbs, who was an arranger, um, you know, uh, Bill Frizzell, uh, Pat Metheny, all these people were, they were really in love with Brazilian music at the time, so it was just this scene. And you know, I, this is what I tell my students, which comes from the Joseph Campbell school of like, you know, follow your heart, you know, follow your bliss. Okay, the guy says, who wrote the myths. Yeah, 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 yeah. The power of myth. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, and it, and it was true. I did. I followed. You know, I, when I realized this is this is it for me. You know, I knew it when I felt it. It was like falling in love. You know. Mm -hmm. 
So that was a very powerful time. So, so then I discovered this place, Drummers Collective, that was at the time, they had a lot of different teachers there. And, at, and so when I really got deep into this stuff, my dad said, look, you're not going to college. I paid for the, your other brothers to go to school and I want you know, to contribute to your education. So if you're gonna go to this Drummers Collective and you love this place, I want you to study with anybody you want, as many teachers as you want, and you know, like you're going, I'm gonna just pay for it. So I was like, wow, great, you know, because there's these other teachers, Frankie Malabe, this guy at the time, uh, Hank Amarillo, uh, uh, Michael Carvin, uh, Kenwood Denard, different drummers from different, you know, parts of the, of the uh, musical community. Some studio drummers, some, you know, Afro-Cuban, some more creative jazz guys. So those teachers, that became like this, like I was studying with like three to five teachers a week and I would study with three and then the next week I'd alternate. And so I had a lot going on. And some of them, like Michael Carvin, he was all about the solo. He was all about, you know, he was just, the first lesson was like, okay, play me a solo. You know, and I was like, <laughs> What? You know, like, you know, solo? I mean, like, what do you mean? Like, play a solo, like, like I'm in a piece of music, you know? Yeah. No, you're the music, everything. You play a solo, like, whatever it is. Play me a sunset, play me a whatever you're feeling, you know? Give me, a, you know, a composition. He was asking me to, you know, make a composition up right there. That was a profound experience. That's what I got from, from Michael, you know? Those lessons were kind of short-lived, but, you know, I studied with him for a while, and he instilled that in me, the creativity your approach of just being there in the moment and, and playing a solo was, was really important. Um, so uh, there were all those, t those teachers at the Drummers Collective at the time. Frankie Malabe was uh, uh, a Congo player, Afro-Caribbean percussionist. And he taught me things like the merengue and the wawanko and all these things that were more folkloric. And uh, he taught mostly congas to other students. And when I came to him, I, I told him that, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm you know, better with the sticks. So he was like, let's apply this stuff to the drums. And then so he no. took all these parts and he, and I actually helped him transcribe for him. You know, the, his first transcriptions I did for the Drummers Collective. His whole thing that he instilled in me was, uh, was clave. What he, and, and in, in Afro-Cuban and Afro-Caribbean music, you know, that the clave and salsa and mambo, they talk about the clave, it's kind of like these, the key rhythms that are in um, that are in you know these in the rhythm section in it's the it's the skeletal structure of how the song is based and where you're phrasing things and he instilled that all the time and we used to he had all these sophisticated other parts going on whether it was in your drumming or the other players were playing it and I didn't get it for so long, but he was just always saying, like, you just gotta, gotta know where the clave is, you gotta know where the clave is. And I was like, man, this is crazy, I'm never gonna get this, you know. And I have to say, after, you know, and I studied with him for years, and, you know, I, I learned a lot from him, you know, a lot of parts and stuff, but that whole instilling the clave thing didn't come till much later. Uh, and I ended up, you know, I ended up falling in love with so much uh, African-oriented, rhythmic-based music that I discovered Frankie the whole time, man, he's there, you know, he had passed away and, 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 I, and, and I wish I could, you know, I dedicated this book to him. Bob Moses was someone I met in that Samba class. So okay. when I was deep into the Samba class, um, Bob Moses had just come back from one of his trips. He goes on a trip every once in a while, blindly on the map and he used to do this with a friend of his and they would go and they went to South America this time. And they ended up in Brazil. He played with Gary Burton, Pat Metheny, did Bright Size Life with Pat Metheny. And he's also a great composer, an artist, you know, a real visionary, not just a drummer, but you know, he's known as the drummer on these records. He came back from Brazil and he was very much wanted to get deeper into Brazilian music and find it where it was happening in New York. So he came to this, to this class, the Samba class. The Drummers Collective, and that's where I met Bob, and he took me under his wing right away because he wanted, he was getting ready to record a record, or he was writing music for, for his next record for Grammavision. And so he asked me, could you come, come to my place in Brooklyn and we can work on some rhythms? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. Hmm. So I had to ask everybody, who's this Bob Moses guy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and everybody's like, you kidding me, man? You better go, because this guy, he's, he's like, you know, legend. 
So I went, and he took me on like a, again, like a, like a son. He was, you know, like he just took me into his world. And um, I, I was able to play, you know, provide the percussion parts that he needed along with my teacher. We became sort of his, uh, his percussion duo behind him. So whenever he had a gig, Manuel and I were, the, were, the, were his two percussionists. And I remember a specific gig at 7th Avenue South, mm -hmm. David Liebman, uh, Jerome Harris, um, you know, all these other great musicians. And you showed up on the gig. And I remember, I didn't know that you knew Dave Liebman, but you came to this gig. I was playing no, with Bob. David and I were in a band together. Right, yeah. and that was, oh, I saw you guys like hugging each other. Oh <laughs> yeah, Billy, oh my God, you know Billy, you know. <laughs> And it was great because I hadn't seen you in years and you just had like decided to come to this gig. So, so that was interesting. You popped in on that scene and there you were and there I was with Moses. And, yeah. um, but Bob, you know, it's funny, Bob, we never had a formal lesson with Bob. Every minute that I was with him was like yeah. a lesson. You know, just watching him, what he does, how does he do, how he does it. Mm -hmm. All the different experiences uh, that I had, you know, doing a session with him. You know, and yeah. I would do anything he wanted me to do. I would carry his drums for him, uh, take notes in the studio, and then he would have me play, you know? And uh, I learned so much. I learned a lot about um, taking your vision to a whole other level, not just you're a drummer who writes some tunes. You hire these musicians, you do the album cover art yourself, you know? Hmm. You, you, uh, you know, you, you you're, just, you're more than a drummer. You're more than a drummer. So right. for me, that was really inspiring. And, and, and to watching someone as a band leader and the way he led a band influenced me, you know. It took me a long time to learn that I was more than a drummer. Yeah. I was just a drummer for a long time. Yeah.